So I think, I think we're going to have a very short panel uh, inviting you to be joined by two others, uh, Alice Enders from uh, Enders Analysis, a household name in kind of the UK media and internet uh, analysis scene, and I'd like her to introduce herself, and also uh, Nanad from DN Capital, which was uh, a change to the program. It was originally going to be Shazam, uh, but unfortunately, the Shazam chap fell ill, and Nanad, who was one of the original investors there and the longest-serving board member, has very kindly offered to step in at short notice. So if perhaps the two of you could just spend a few seconds introducing yourselves, and then we'll go right into it. Alice. Uh, yes, Ender's Analysis is a supplier, a B2B supplier of reports and consultancy on uh, everything having to do with the internet, including the underlying technologies, mobile technologies, and the use of content. We've focused an awful lot on disruption of traditional media models and the opportunities that that uh, implies for new entrants. Thanks. So uh, I work for DN Capital, uh, a firm that uh, myself and Steve Schlenker set up in uh, 2000. Uh, we invest in early stage and growth capital in digital media, software, e-commerce. <laughs> Uh, focused on the UK, Germany, the Nordics, and the US. Uh, I've been investors in Shazam since 2004, uh, seen quite a few waves in the company and also in music. Uh, and the company now, as you might know, has 250 million users. We gain between two or three million new users per week, uh, growing very rapidly, and we can talk more about that. All right, so let me start with a, another question for Jörg just after his great presentation, which was in, in all the slides that you showed there was no mention of the word artist, the producer in, in the value chain. And it took until the last slide for you to actually mention that word. Um, how important is their contribution to the value chain? And do you think that they could be an agent of disruption? I think the, uh, obviously it all starts with the, with the art itself. So that's music. Um, the reason why it, I haven't highlighted this in this presentation because, is because I don't think it's so much a matter of input, it's more an issue of fixing distribution. That's where the key problem of the industry is. Um, you can create fantastic product, but if you're not able to reach your customers, you have no business. And as an industry, we've allowed distribution to disappear. Um, for a while, the industry has actually been obstructive to new distribution models in order to maintain you know, the old ways. Um, and I think that's where the biggest problem is. It's not about whether Radiohead goes to Universal or to Warner Music. These are obviously very important artists that can have an, a massive impact. But I don't think those are the things that will make or break the industry right now. What will make or break the industry and the monetization of music an artist's ability to derive significant income from, what, from their work is if we can fix distribution and figure out how we can engage consumers. And not only in the Western world, but also in the emerging markets. I think that's the most important thing. Um, further to your point, however, it has become a lot easier for established artists um, to self-distribute, um, to work with others than the majors in order to get their royalties and collect their royalties and, and all of that. So I do believe that major artists have the ability <coughs> to disrupt the old business model of the major labels. Um, what we see, however, is that you know, a lot of artists actually value the contribution um, and the home um, and the hand-holding that the big labels give them. And if you think in the sort of golden era 20 years ago before the industry was disrupted by the internet. When we were all wearing, wearing, wearing funny, funny when, shirts. When you had funny shirts and uh, had great parties. Uh, at that time, the typical economic relationship between an artist and a, and a label was one where the artist pre-sold their work for either you know, one or many albums for a fixed fee and gave up 85 plus percent of the economics of the business to the label and only once that was recouped, which very rarely happened, did they then see more money. So there, it, it was a slightly strange form of venture capital. Do you see that economic model evolving in a way that 
for, the, for the value contribution that labels have made, which is around promotion, marketing, and packaging, and distribution, that as those functions evolve in a digital age, that the economic relationship with artists will evolve as well. This is something that always puzzles me with this industry, um, because the issue you have is it's indeed a mix of venture capital and a service. So we invest in young artists or new artists, give them an advance, help them develop their product, um, help them to get on the road, to be promoted, to make a name and all of that. And at the same time, we tie this into a business relationship, which is a distribution deal. Um, and I think this generally leads to tensions. Um, what I've been advocating, but which apparently seems to be very, very difficult, is that we should actually look for different models where we split this, where you say, okay, you're a new artist, um, you need capital and help. For this, we set up a joint enterprise where we take an investment and we will be your seed investor. And beyond that, we'll have a distribution deal, um, which is on market terms. That, that seems to be very difficult to achieve, um, but I think it will actually be something very interesting to develop over time because what we have now is if an artist becomes incredibly successful, they might end up resenting the first deal they've done you know, for the five or seven albums. <clears throat> However, I don't think Mark Zuckerberg resents his first investors uh, in Facebook. Although he didn't dilute by 85%. No, but I mean, <laughs> just as a, you know, obviously, if, if you do this deal, uh, you wouldn't be able to do this, uh, 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 you, you know, the, the artist would have to have majority right. in his company, otherwise you take away the incentive. Um, and the 85%, it's not 85%, by the way. Um, it was in the golden years. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, at some point it was 100%, right, uh, for, for artists who were ill-advised early on. Um, but I... But this doesn't apply to all their earnings, right? It That's doesn't true. take into account what they make in marketing. It doesn't take into account the money they make from touring and from live music and all these kind of things. This is a deal around selling records and tracks. Right. Let, let me bring in Alison and Ninad. You know, bubbling up a level, what do you think are some of the more interesting trends uh, around mobile and some of the applications that could improve the distribution that Jörg has highlighted is, is a problem facing the industry as a whole? Well, the first thing is, is that I think that mobile is definitely a huge opportunity. Um, that is what has given credibility to the subscription model. Um, without mobile, I think we would have still been stuck in 10 more years of Rhapsody limping along. So mobile is an incredibly important opportunity for music. I wanted to highlight also some of the opportunities around apps. I think that, you know, social apps, music, these are things that go very well together. Also, from an investor point of view, music actually attracts a certain passion. So you will find that high net worth individuals, for example, are very attracted to investing in music services. Um, there seems to be no shortage of money to back Spotify, Deezer, and so on, despite there being quite a few casualties along the way. And Shazam, for example, is just sort of inching its way towards break-even. So music has characteristics that are really distinct from other types of content in that it is an emotional thing, it is a passionate thing. York himself is deeply passionate about his vinyl collection, and so will you be as well, if he has his way. So, so just to, uh, to Shazam counter, uh, should defend so on itself. Shazam, our music business <laughs> has been profitable and cash flow generative for a long time. We've mm -hmm. actually started to invest a lot in TV. But on the music um, point, I, I think uh, you mentioned the social aspect. I think social has not even really started in music. I mean, I love Spotify, but really trying to use Spotify socially is awkward. It's not there yet. There's, there's a lot of work it can do. I think combining things like Shazam with Spotify with Songkick and putting all those three things together where you can actually, your friend tags a song on a Saturday night, shares it with you, and they also are rating, so it's a five rating. I want to see all my friends' five rating tags and then have a station start on Spotify with exactly the song my friend tagged. Now that integration is nowhere near where it should be, and I think over the next six, 12, 18 months, uh, you'll start to see more applications like 
Shazam or even you know our competitor SoundCloud uh, or, or SoundHound working with the Deezers and uh, the Spotify's of the world to make that integration complete. So, so if you look at what Shazam was originally set up for, which was to aid the discovery of music. You know, you hear a track and you record it and figure out what it is. Um, you know, when I was growing up, there were many ways that you could discover music from magazines like Enemy and Billboard and Time Out to um, John Peel and some great radio DJs. W what is the kind of modern equivalent of that? What does that look like? Is that an automated service? Is that something that's curated, uh, like eight tracks? You know, what are the different ideas that you can foresee to, to help solve that particular problem? Because discovery is a real problem, I agree with you. Uh, you know, I, I love some of the streaming services, but finding stuff sure. systematically is very, very hard. Well, I think it comes down to the, a combination of curation by DJs and then also your friends. I think you, we all have friends that are music savvy we want to, and you know, you always hear great tunes from them. Uh, and for guys like us, also, we're probably not the target demographic by any means, right? Because uh, you know, we're, we don't have time to, to, to do all this stuff. But um, I think it's a combination of friends and, and DJs and radio uh, to get these um, to, to, to discover new music. Yeah, do you have anything to add to that? <clears throat> I agree, um, but I don't think it can be. Uh, you know, I don't. I don't, it, I don't think it can all be about friends recommending something to friends, nor can it all be about an algorithm which predicts what you might like. Uh, that usually doesn't work that well. I do believe there needs to be some human cre uh, curation, and I would think that at some point we'll see the reemergence of you know, a modern day John Peel uh, in a digital world. I don't know yet how this would work, but I think that would be a necessity. And you know, related question, what, what happens to the radio industry? Is that a casualty of the move to digital? You know, is advertising going to desert radio? And uh, because we haven't seen online, you know, any success yet with either sort of Google's DMARC acquisition or Target Spot is still, you know, right. yet to reach the promised land. I think radio will be there for a long time. I think radio is a fantastic format for commuters, and we all spend a lot of time commuting. It's also a music discovery channel of very substantial significance to the music industry. And uh, the teens, in particular, listen to a lot of radio, even though there's a lot of internet in their lives. They listen to a yeah. lot of commercial radio. Would you call um, um, a Pandora radio, or would you call it streaming? Because some, some people might call Pandora radio. It is it, definitely radio. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's radio, but there's a, 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 a lesser degree of serendipity, probably, than if I had a human right. figuring out what, what to play. And it's also, because by virtue of its personalization, um, sure. you know, different kind of medium. So, OK. Just, I, I know we have a, a lot of investors in the room. One interesting question I always like to ask panels like this of um, knowledgeable sector experts is if, if they could name kind of one or two companies not in their portfolio that they admire from afar or you know, think are rising stars that might not necessarily be billion dollar companies in the makings but are really neat and that for people in the audience who are music lovers might want to check out. So I don't know if there's we start with you, Alice. Are there one or well, two companies that you really like? Actually, one of the things we haven't spoken about is how the enjoyment of music depends on your equipment. And one of the companies I've really liked a lot is Beats. I think it's got a fantastic proposition. Is it brought back audiophile level listening quality? And the value, there's a lot of value in that sort of area. And uh, now they're moving into a digital music service. Um, that's obviously a very competitive landscape, a completely different opportunity. But uh, the Beats headphones and, and uh, that whole space, I think, is uh, full of innovation and bringing back audiophilic qualities to our listening and enjoyment of music. Yeah, I have to echo Beats because that's the, mm -hmm. the, the leading music brand these days. Um, I don't think there's anything like it. Um, other ones that I really find, um, you know, very interesting and helpful um, businesses are Shazam, 
um, SoundCloud, and then for content owners, Cobalt. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I love Spotify. I think, it's, as I mentioned, it's on version 1.0. I think Spotify has a long way to go, and I think integration with some of these other. Also, Songkick. Um, also, it's the same thing. Um, these companies are early, so um, long way to go. I think we're running out of time, so thank you very much to the panel, and particularly for Jörg for the presentation, and I think Marco's going to introduce uh, our next 